here in DC, I guess these are the people that you run into. <laughs> uh all right well let's talk some record stuff because uh as i said cooch has cooch has got some cool stuff on for show and tell too but uh jerry you're talking about a count vertigo uh find score uh yeah it's like um when was this in well i don't know when that i forgot when that count vertigo single came out but i remember um there was this place on sandy boulevard in portland a uh, record store. I've talked to people since, and they remember the name of it. That's a little independent record store that had a bunch of stuff, in, and right next to a liquor store. So me and I wasn't 21 yet, so it had to have been before 1983, probably 1982, and um, 83, 82. And we went over there, and we would shoulder tap and get have people buy us alcohol. And you guys call it would, shoulder tapping too. No one else calls it shoulder tapping. That's what we call it in Toronto. Never heard yeah. of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you go, hey, you, buddy. So, um, and we we got like our, our booze and we went in the alleyway. We're sitting there drinking and uh, this record store folded, shut down. So they took a shopping cart of vinyl and just rolled it out. I guess they were throwing it in the dumpster, all their, their vinyl. So we're over there looking through the stuff and I got a box, a sealed box, and I ripped them open and they were four, big hole 45s, about 50, I think 50 per box, because I know they weren't 100. And they were the Count Vertigo 45s without without the sleeve, without the sleeve. Yeah. So, because we were we were drinking in this alleyway and there was a, a street and then there was the freeway over this and we would drink and we'd sit there and we'd like throw these records and they would, you know, and they would bomb. And I don't think we ever hit a car, but they would like, you know, hit the freeway as cars were driving by on the freeway and we we're chucking them. And um, we had these Count Vertigo 45s and we're throwing them at the, at the freeway, bombing, bombing cars that were going by as we're drinking off our, off our thunderproof vodka, bombing cars. So, uh, damn, yeah. and then, literally throwing money and, away. And then a couple of years later, I lived in an apartment building downtown Portland, and Count Vertigo lived downstairs. Oh wow! What's he like? Well, he um, was like a rest in peace. I think. Like, he um, we hear we lived on the fourth floor in a five story building, and we hear uh, people up on the roof some nights like howling, like howling at the moon, like really late, like three in the morning, and we didn't know what it was, and we talked to people, and they go, "It's that guy down in the." room downstairs that could, and he would he would literally be howling like 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 you know and so one night i went down there and uh was like creeping around listening and it was kind of like psycho i heard it's like you know mother like don't you talk to me like that and it was like oh my god and he was talking in both voices he was talking to both voices behind this door and then it scared me it actually scared me i was like and i was like a you know scrapper back then i was like jesus this is so i so I, I left and i was scared count vertigo and then about a month later because he was he was just kind of going spinning out of control by that time and uh the sheriffs came and gave him an eviction notice and he sealed himself in he's not he sealed himself with boards and sealed himself in and would not let the cops in there and sealed himself in this room in this little apartment building downtown portland and uh be screaming in his mother's voice. Wow. <laughs> Howling at the moon, screaming in his mother's voice while the cops were like trying to serve him papers. And he was like, you know, so it was, it was that, quite the That record just got even more interesting to me. That is, yeah. wow. That is, yeah. Like it's, uh, well, I guess that's the thing is like all different sorts of people were drawn to this thing, you know, people that needed punk and people that, you know, you know, maybe not necessarily balanced in their terms of their uh, mental health, and and of course, you know, there's I've I've howled the moon so many times, and I've, you know, there's this, like I say, there's, I, as my book says, you know, there was a time where I was to that point of just like far beyond that, so it's so you know, it's like yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's. It's just, it's a, it's the last it's the last big bang here, it's, and it's still going. I'm 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 
I'm so, you know, lucky to be part of like, you know, to grab that new wave, surfing on that new wave when it happened. Because it's it was it's it's the last there hasn't been anything like it, any youth movement since since, you know. It's the last one. I yeah, mean, can you tell me No yeah. No, like well, I guess there's like there is stuff, but it it's not like this was, right? Because this was like a complete democratization of culture where yeah. around you know, the world. Around the world, exactly. And if you could if you as long as you had economic means to do so, you brought this up actually last time on the show. And it completely changed the way I look at punk history when you were talking about how certain scenes are better documented than other scenes because people had economic means to buy video cameras or pay for records or, and if you didn't, you had to find alternative ways to pay for these records, you know, and, and to pay for these being in a band because it costs money. So as long as you had access to some way to get economic means or access to this thing, you could, the world was your oyster. You could write your own ticket. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. So, so Crypt. Yes. What do you got in your bag of tricks? Oh, well, I, I was going to pull this out before. I thought it was relevant to the conversation, but I don't know if you can see this. So this is one of my copies of Darby Crash, but it says, "Give me your drugs." Signed, Jerry A. <laughs> well, that's my writing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's ten out of eighty. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's the sign, right? That's is that the second or fourth edition, right? On blue, it's the blue one, yeah. I think that's the fourth press. Yeah, so you know the story about that, about the oh, that's the Darby Crash. Yeah. Okay, I was gonna say the Pick Your King. You know the story about the Pick Your King, the black and the clear ones. Yeah, right? Malcolm told me the story one time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so broke my heart to find out that story because I I waited forever to get a clear one and finally got a clear one only to find out that it's the second press. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? But the clear ones came first, and we had, um, you know, glued them and everything. And, you know, when we put all the love into them, then the second, <laughs> and then the old ones came back, and we're just like, oh, let's just Xerox a sleeve and slap and throw them out and get them out there, you know? What's the yeah, story? Think, oh, go on, Turkish. Oh, I was just going to say um, the one, the first time I met Malcolm, and he was telling me about all this stuff, and he was like, well, me and Tom just bought like a ton of cocaine and stayed up for a whole weekend and glued all those sleeves together. <laughs> Yeah, this this person I was with you the other week, um, same thing. He lived with Tom and and the guy, the the dealer. We all did that. We had like these sessions, you know. And it says like you think you you know you do a thousand sleeves, but you really don't. You do like a hundred, and then you're like tired <laughs> yeah. until the next until the next session, you know. Yeah. <laughs> what was the story behind uh, the uh, Portland edition? Of Kings of Punk. Um, that's the Pusshead one, right? Yeah, and there's like a there's a Portland edition that has two posters and two stickers, and it was like uh, a Portland exclusive, I believe, or something, right? Is that the story, Cooch, or something? I, yeah, I guess so. Well, that's the you one that the it, Pus, yeah. Well, the Pusshead made for the you know because Tom, um, we thanked all those bands on that, yeah, on the poster, and Tom. You know that was before that was before Screwdriver uh, turned into like the, what they became, and they they were kind of I think I don't I'm not sure what single came out about that time. Maybe it was Back with a Bang. It was one of the ones that wasn't. They weren't full on. They didn't do the the bad one, right? Yeah, the bad yeah. single yet. But anyway, Tom thanked. I think he thanked. Is Gigi Allen on the on the poster? You'd have to look yeah okay well he's okay well tom thanked i, I remember puss had censored two people tom said he goes i want to thank screwdriver and i want to thank i think it was gg allen and puss said wouldn't do it and tom <laughs> and tom lost it he got really mad because he's like this is censoring you know it was like if you if you i mean they had like hank williams and you know orson wills and all these people that you know but but these are the people that influenced Tom and he, you know, from, he liked that record. He liked that first record. It's a, just a bad rock and roll record, you know? So. Well, it's like, a, I guess it's a completely different lineup from what they would ultimately become. Same with Gigi okay. Allen, obviously Gigi Allen in that period versus the Gigi Allen at the end. Seems like it was a slightly different person as well, but, but sure. I'm sure. Yeah. 
um i guess when you're <laughs> i guess when you're at maximum rock and roll and you're kind of around those circles back then you realize like yeah it's better probably better just to censor this <laughs> is it is there ever a, a time that's better to censor anything <laughs> well i think the the gizem reissue they took off the swastika you know and i think that's one of those things where it's like this might cause more headaches than brings people to the record well when we put out the inmates lp they the place that we used to do the posters wouldn't do it because it said like fuck off jesus and mary or just like something really <laughs> you know offensive to some people pretty tame like in the grand scheme of things yeah yeah <laughs> walter from imprint called me and he's like we got this real holy roller he called him over at the print shop and he's like and they won't run that job for you <laughs> Well, well the idea is sorry on Dre. No, you see an opportunity to start a printing plant that like welcomes all blasphemous <laughs> <Right>. material. Yes. <laughs> we'll print anything. Yeah, there you go. Uh where did the idea to kind of start signing these records come from too? Because there's like a there's a couple different poison idea records that had signed editions. A lot of them, seems like. Yeah. You know, I don't know where I mean who would be the first band to sign records i it's off i mean i know we didn't make it up I, we probably had something that was you know i have a signed flash record i have a signed generation x record but they're not uh, like an addition like they, it wasn't like the clash being like okay there's gonna be a hundred signed versions of this record on this color of vinyl or numbered this much and we're gonna you know like there's a couple different records that have this sort of like signed edition type thing and i can't think of other bands that did that now I can think of more bands doing it, but like back then. Yeah, like the live one with the signatures over the passports. Yeah. You know, I don't think we we set out to do that. I don't think we set out to do it. We just, we just kind of felt like, we, you know, that was, we just did that. I don't remember like, you know, signing and thinking that, we, you know, we just kind of did it as we were like signing them. That's just, I don't, I don't think we like really... Thought, thought that out, thought that through. We, it's just what, something that came to us. Well, because now, punish now me, they're all. That, it's a whole new thing. Now I'm thinking about that. I'm like, did we actually think about doing that? Did we think about? Well, like, yeah. there must be because like there's that there like the one that Cooch just showed, and there's also obviously the punish me one where there's all different. You know what? How many members sign it varies, but there's always like a signed of that version of that record, the first press and numbered. It seems like. You know, like that idea that you're talking about, like folding the sleeves, like that's a way to have that sort of, I don't know, like that authenticity touching the hand of the band type thing. And well, maybe that, maybe that's where it came from because I think, I think one of the first times we saw that was from like the, uh, all of the, um, like the process of elimination thing and those, those fixed singles. They're not fixed, but negative approach where they would sign the inside of them and, and write stuff. Yeah. So that was taking it, you know. Yeah, yeah, because it's 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 so cool. Like I love, obviously, like Cooch and I are both, you know, massive collector nerds about Poison Idea records. But there's just something so neat about that being a thing. And and like yeah, it's like there's not too many bands doing it. Like obviously, bands are like writing on the sleeves. But the idea that like, you know, this is this is something more than that. Yeah. So so Chris, let me ask you. That there's one record that um, I've heard about before that. The pus had the the yellow flexi disc, the Japanese flexi disc. <laughs> Which what like the one that comes with the Japanese LPs? The poison idea. Uh, Japanese flexi yellow. Do you do you have that? No. Yeah. The rare. The, that was like it came with what like cleanse the bacteria Japanese edition or something, and I just never bothered to pony up the money yeah. for it. Yeah, that's the one. I've never, I've never seen it. Or I've heard about it. It's one of those, you know, one of those things you hear about, but you never see it. It took me forever to find the uh, Babes in Toyland split. Oh, not the Babes in Toyland split. There's like a an Australian only split, right? Yeah, Babes, that was it. Yeah. Babes in Toyland. The Babes in Toyland one, yeah. <laughs> what, what a strange, you know, what it, it's like when you see those old, like, you know, like whatever like pink floyd and, you know like tom jones or something you know <laughs> and label sample. it's like that same thing babes in toilet and poison idea it's like wow well you're also That's... on a split seven inch with nirvana <laughs> well that kind of makes sense it's a little closer way. to home though yeah it's true yeah. but babes in toyland it's funny when you talk to 
you talk to the people from Bikini Kill, you talk to a lot of the people from Seattle. It seems like they had a real tight connection to the Seattle scene. I guess less so to Portland. Um, Nirvana? No, no, Babes in Toyland. Oh yeah, well they they did that sub pop thing, you know the the yeah, and they and they would they were it was like Minneapolis and Seattle was kind of like there's always been a the Northwest and Minnesota a lot of uh lot like Norwegian giant you know back and forth there's like there's like the from the settlers days from hundreds of years ago they they would like we have like relatives in the mid minnesota right there and they you know they come they go west young man and yeah so yeah it's it's uh we've always i mean we've the from from like laughing hyenas uh urge overkill babes in toyland all the you know replacements from the first time from the first tours they would come to the northwest and they would you know husker do i mean they came here the first time and um portland and seattle and they stayed here for like five days and you know they came to portland just like loved it it was like a home away from home so it's we've always been there's a, there's a lot of places to, i think like boston new york kind of does that in a way they're kind of you know well i know on olympia certainly and and uh washington dc have that kind of connection as well definitely and uh, yeah, it, it, it's funny uh, that first Husker Du tour. There's like a website you can see all the shows they ever played, and it seems like they went to every city and stayed like three or four days, including Calgary. Oh. They did three or four days in Calgary, Vancouver, yeah, Portland, as you said, Seattle, and uh, it, it's a, it's a fascinating kind of thing to watch them do this tour, and then they come back, of course, and they've once again they've they've brought back the sort of hardcore sound with them, to much to the chagrin, I'm sure, of some local people. Yeah. Oh, Cooch, what else you got in the box? I don't know. What do you want to know about? <laughs> what do we need to talk about? What do you got test press wise? Um, all right, let's see. All right, so here's pick your king test press. That's got, wild. That was from Malcolm. Uh, I think it belonged to Tom previously. So is that sign? Is the label signed? No, you know. All right, so yeah, I think this one's just blank. Okay. But it has like um, this homemade sleeve with it. Uh huh. Have, have, have you seen the Have you seen the one the the with the label signed? This is like delving deep into my <laughs> memory here. Um, I remember like maybe like in the beginnings of eBay, someone sold a test press and it said like. It had a whole bunch of stuff that you must have written by yourself and it sold at the time for like a hundred bucks which was more than i you know would have ever spent on a record in 1998 or whatever so yeah i, I, wrote, I, I wrote something like to my friend tom and i wrote, i signed it and it said all this shit on this is our yeah. first record blah 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 yeah that, that record mysteriously disappeared from tom's house and uh wound up we kind of have our our theories where who took it and where it went but uh yeah, I, I saw that one. I saw that one time, and then you know what? It was like years later, after Tom passed, and and I was like, "That's where that went. That's the record. What you know?" So, I think yeah, I'd have to get in touch with. I think it's some kid in Detroit has it. It might be like a friend of a friend. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wonder if it sounds better than the the record, the other records. <laughs> I don't think it sounds. <laughs> well, then, oh, go um, on. Somebody else, oh, Jeff Nelson from Minor Threat sold one on eBay that was had like a really lengthy note from Malcolm and it might have had like, um, you know, him buying wholesale copies of like Discord singles and stuff. But it was like, right. you know, here's the record we're putting out, like, check it out and let me know what you think. Uh, and that's that awesome. sold like, you know, thousands of dollars or something. Yeah. And then after that, Malcolm hit me up and was like, "Hey, this guy I know wants to sell this copy. Do you want it?" And I was like, "Yeah, sure." And I was going wow. to Seattle to visit a friend at the time, so we drove down to his house and bought a bunch of records from him. Wow. Yeah, you know, like I say, that that's it's I I totally understand because I, you know, I have that that Protex single and right. that Pink Section single, and it means something to me. But um, 
it's it's about the music and and I and we're putting together the stuff with me and Mark now and and yeah. me with American Leather doing the things and and each one's you know a, a work of love and and I like creating these things and I like you know presenting these and giving them to the world and stuff and I can see that you know at one time that must have you know the first the first pick your kings or the second pick your kings or the record collectors they were they were you know what we did and we sent them out there and they were you know but uh i don't know when it comes down to it it, it is you know the music and stuff but I, I dig the art and i you know yeah i'll always love it and it's cool yeah. to mark sends me yeah. like copies of all the records to sort of like beta test before they come out <laughs> He's yeah. always hitting me up for my opinion and stuff. So, well, he's you know he's doing a great job. He's yeah, doing a really good job on this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It's good. It's finally. I don't know. It's it, like obviously you guys have had records come out, but as you talked about before, it wasn't always under <laughs> your discretion or by your choice in some cases. With and so to have these records come out properly now and you know kind of these authoritative editions of stuff and to have all this stuff in one place, it's it's awesome yeah i mean some of some of the mixes like on like tang or whatever or, or some of these things are just are just so you know cut corner just sound like crap and you know and that's the finals is just it's yeah it's i don't know it, it's 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 nice to like have some say into it and put some you know quality it's i bought one of the uh i think it was like the last tang version of I don't know, record collectors or whatever before Mark started doing this stuff. And I thought it was like a low, even a low point for him where the center label of the record was like an ad for his label. <laughs> Whoa, oh, that's amazing. I love that edition now. And even, I don't even know if it had like the Poison Idea logo on it, but it was, it was like, you know, for more Tang products, like www. <laughs> wow. wow. Reminds me of that Smith song that, you know, Death at One's Elbow or whatever. It's like, you know, that song where it's like, you know, a, a throw in a tacky badge and whatever, repackage, reissue, rebuy, you know, this and this. And it's just like, you know, that's what it reminds me of. It's just like the guy's more, more worth more dead than alive, you know, just keep fucking putting out the same stuff and repackaging it and throw in, throw in a button, throw in a sticker, you know, a, you know, free t shirt with this and that. It's with the same quality just keeps you know just going xeroxing it over and over so it's diminished more and more and just <laughs> one of my favorite my protect single in my collection i guess would be my rkl record that was an edition that doug moody put out signed by doug moody <laughs> <laughs> nice He's still nice alive. i should start doing that you know on american leather i'm a i just got the new dissension from la tonight i listened to it and it's sounds crazy i'm like wow this sounds like old punk from the 80s you guys are really really from long beach and i'm going to put it out and i'm going to do that i'm going to start I, when the records come out i should, I should sign them all myself even though <laughs> exactly. i have nothing to do with it at all i should put them on the front of it well i think that's that's like the sub pop style too right like where where it's like make the label more important than the record you know make it like the label sells the record more than the record sells the label right sure well that is sub pop yeah there's yeah, I'm going to Seattle Airport. There it is. Yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't. They don't have a Matador store in the New York Airport in LaGuardia or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there could be a Tang record store at Logan. I don't know. <laughs> there's a just to get away. There's the rejected test press, which has a different. Is it a different mastering job, Cooch, or a different mix? I don't know that any of the ones that are rejects I've ever been able to tell the difference. I listened to them. I think there's like, I thought there was, but it's been a long time since I did a side by side comparison. Again, I, yeah, I probably haven't listened to these records in a million years. So, yeah. Is there like any other rejected test press with different mixes on them or different things like that? Um, oh, yeah. I, think, I, know, I know what. Record the, collectors, the, right? Yeah, that one. And getting the fear. Well, there's one of the Beast Goes East. There's a thing where, where, they, uh, where Tom's guitar is completely out of the mix. Oh, yeah. Oh, whoa. And it sounds like, yeah, it's bad. And so we had to fix that. But there's there's a couple that, um, I mean, you know what? It's, there, there's, there's, we're, we're releasing new records now. And it's like subliminal. We put like way in the back. I, I'm like whispering. I'm like, <laughs> so, like <laughs> so it's like, you can't really hear it, but it's, 
I want to mix with all that and push way up to the front. Just your, your, uh, (laughs) cut everything back and put a disco beat on it. It's like, what's the story on the, you guys catching someone bootlegging the record and taking all the copies? Is that a story? Like there's something like there's a seven inch bootleg, uh, which I guess is maybe the same recording as official bootleg. Maybe not, but like you guys caught the bootlegger. Oh, you know what? That sounds. There's so many weird Damien. things like that that could have happened. Which one? Is it this, Damien? Yeah, yeah. No, is that the the double seven inch or the? That's no, the that's like the. That's the bootleg. But I think yeah. the double seven inch is is maybe the same recording or. It's just it's a bootleg seven inch of the plastic bomb cassette. Yeah, you know what? Like I've seen. I've gone into record stores or been on tour and played festivals and seen that kind of stuff. And I just asked the guy, I'm like, this is mine. This is a bootleg. And sometimes they, sometimes they give it up. And, you know, I, I joke about it with other things, you know, like the guy who made our socks. I said that I go, this guy, bootleg, but I was totally in cahoots with him. We, it was together, but it was so funny because boys had his socks. I'm like, that's so, you know, but, um, those yeah i've done that i've gone to festivals and seen poison idea bootlegs and just taken you know the couple copies they've they've had and what are they going to do you know but that i I remember i've done that a few times it's not like uh oh what i'm thinking yeah it's the plastic bomb we got the beat and there's like there's a version that i guess the bootlegger did first and then there's a version that you guys sign and number once again back to that sign and numbered edition thing (laughs) Yeah, like I said, I you know we I've been stores before and, and seen bootlegs and you know what are you gonna do? I've you know got pissed before and, and done that. Um, I you know when when uh, I remember an old time when uh, Alchemy owed us money and and we went to when Victor worked at Rough Trade in San Francisco and we went in there and had somebody wait outside and, and kind of like shut the shut the close sign and um just kind of bullied them what walked in there and said we want you know want our stuff and the people didn't know it and we started kind of like breaking stuff and acting like assholes and um it was bad it was bad we were bad people we, we went to the record store and there was like six of us one guy waited outside and we went inside and said we want to talk to victor and they're like he's not here and like well this is our stuff we started taking stuff and people started knocking shit off the shelves and walking around and they're like what are you doing what are you doing they're like you know and we started kind of like trying to be tough guys and um just intimidating them and we're like we want to you know we want our stuff and we left and by the time we drove from san francisco to portland he left a message and is like, you have your master tapes, you have this, you have, you know, everything's on its way. Don't worry. So we, we paid him. It's just, I'm not proud of that stuff now. You know, it's like the stuff you do when you're young and stupid. I think it's, it looks funny on movies and stuff, but in real life people, you know, get affected by it. It's like just it, intimidating people. It's like, <laughs> you know, it was, it was makes for a good story. Well, and it's also just like the reality of, you know, this is, you know, like you're not going to hire a lawyer and go after this guy in court. Well, basically, it's like taking the bootlegs again. Same yeah. thing. Yeah. It's like going and taking the bootlegs. What, you know, that's what it, it kind of comes down to that. If you boil away all the fluff, it, the end result is doing that, you know? So why cut away, why not cut away all the, you know, to begin with and get to the, to the action? And that's what we did, you know? It's interesting now where like bootlegging has become such a part of culture, you know, like it's just like established that people bootleg, but like, you know, fuck the bootlegger was definitely written on a bunch of records I have or, and, and, you know, like the stories of taking the records from bootleggers, bootleggers at one point, it's like, it was looked as theft. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah. You know what? I know people who do that and stuff kind of, and, uh, it's, I, all, all this, I mean, it's, I have no opinion on it because it's, 
what are you going to do? You know, I, I have my own opinion, but I'm not going to like spew and start going crazy right now because I, I think it's fucked. And I think, um, I think artists need to be paid. And I think, uh, you know, no matter what it is, no matter what it is, me and my wife just went on a thing last night about that, about this person talking about how it all should be free and all this stuff. And, and the only people who say that are people who've never worked in their lives and, and never had to like, you know, it's, yeah, I think, um, you know, I don't know. That's the reality. Like, you know, it costs money to produce this thing. And, you know, unless no one's really getting rich off it. And the idea that, like, you're going to take something away from the person that made it is, is you know, I think that's something that I think I can understand why people think it's fucked. Yeah. I mean, I could, you know, we, we could we could take these live jack white or live metallica or live whatever tapes and 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 press them up and, and make money off them and, and you know people think well they're they're already millionaires so why should they care and stuff but that's you know it's like where where do you draw the line well that's, and they will you know, sue you they will they will come after you in a way that they won't even just shake you down at the records or they'll shake your whole family down for for everything <laughs> Maybe okay. not Jack White, you know, or maybe maybe not Metallica personally, but there there'll be a lawyer involved. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take you up on that one. Let's see about that. <laughs> Let's see. 